throughout ancient texts, there are references to what I call misunderstood technology. So they would have thought this is something that's angelic or from another dimension or godlike. Humans have built some important things. The Great Wall of China, the Apollo 11 moon lander, the McRib. <laughs> But they all pale in comparison to a project started in 1991 by a Finnish college student because he was bored. Yoda! Linux is the only thing keeping the 21st century from turning into the 14th century overnight. Most people think the 90s were won by Microsoft, and for the desktop, the right. But while Bill Gates was winning the office, a Finnish student and a global hey, army of angry nerds were winning the foundation. <laughs> They didn't build the computer on your desk. They built the world that computer talks to. If Linux didn't make personal computers cheap, what did it do? It made the services on those computers cheap. It's the greatest group project in history, and you're using it right now to watch this. Before we talk about how Linux saved the world, we have to talk about what it actually is. It's a kernel. In my last video, I talked about the kernel as the homeowner of your computer. If your hardware, the CPU, the RAM, the disk, is the house, the kernel is the guy holding the keys to every room. It's the Ring Zero Manager. It decides who gets to use a CPU, how much memory an app can eat, and it's a referee that prevents your web browser from accidentally nuking your GPU. Back in the early 90s, operating systems were these giant, unchangeable monoliths. If you wanted to support a new type of keyboard, you basically had to rebuild the entire foundation. But Linux was built to be modular. Modularity is just like Legos. Instead of one solid brick of code, Linux lets you plug in modules like drivers or file systems while the machine is still running. You add a new driver and suddenly the kernel knows what a web is. Because of this, Linux is a shapeshifter. It can be stripped down to almost nothing. This is exactly how Android exists. Google took the Linux kernel, stripped out the desktop fluff, added touchscreen modules, and put it in everyone's pocket. Linux didn't just stay on servers. It became the reason billions of people can afford a supercomputer in their genes. A few inches later. By the year 2000, the internet was the wild Baba west. Boy. You needed expensive proprietary hardware to protect a network. Then came NetFilter. To understand NetFilter, you have to understand that the internet is just a billion packets flying through tubes. A packet is like an envelope. And as a header, the address, and a payload, the actual data, like a piece of a cat photo. NetFilter is the routing logic inside the kernel. It's the bouncer that looks at every envelope and asks, where are you from and where are you going? And are you allowed to bring that stuff in here? Because NetFilter was free and built into Linux, every cheap home router could suddenly become a sophisticated firewall. It democratized internet security. If your router costs $40 instead of $4,000, you have the Linux kernel to thank for that. In 2007, Linux merged KVM, the kernel-based virtual machine. KVM is essentially inception, but for your hardware. It turns the Linux kernel into a hypervisor. A virtual machine is an entire independent operating system, a guest, running as a single isolated process inside another operating system called the host. To the host kernel, the VM is just a regular task or process, just like a Chrome tab or a Spotify playlist. But to the guest, it thinks it's kind of the king of the castle. Think of it like this. You're playing Minecraft on your PC. That's your host. Inside your world, you find a villager who is also hey, playing a complete completely separate full speed game of Minecraft on a tiny laptop. To you, the villager is just a character in your world, a single process that you're tracking. But to the villager, their game is their entire reality. They have no idea that they're actually running inside your CPU cycles. It's a dream within a dream. This is the birth of the cloud. Before KVM, if you wanted to run 100 websites, you needed 100 physical boxes. Now, you buy one massive metal server run KVM and carve it into 100 virtual slices. AWS and Google Cloud aren't magic. They're just giant warehouses of Linux machines running thousands of villager Minecraft games. Without this, Netflix would still be mailing you DVDs because hosting the video files for 200 million people on individual physical servers would have been an economic suicide mission. Virtual machines are great, but they're heavy because every guest needs its own kernel. In 2008, Google engineers gave Linux C groups and namespaces. This created the container. A container is not a virtual machine. It doesn't even have its own kernel. It's just a regular process that the host this kernel has lied to. Namespaces give the process tunnel vision where it can't see other processes. And C groups give it a resource allowance where you can only eat 100 megabytes of RAM, for example. It's like putting a process in a soundproof room with a snack bar. This is how TikTok and Uber scale. They don't launch a thousand VMs. They launch a thousand Linux containers in milliseconds. Now, fast forward to 2014. We have the first ever eBPF. If the kernel is a homeowner, eBPF is like giving him a super sensor suit. Historically, the kernel was a black box. 
you can see inside without stopping the machine. eBPF lets us run, safe, sandbox code inside the kernel while it's running at full speed. And we've only scratched the surface of this. In the future, eBPF will allow for self-healing networks that detect a hack and rewrite their own security rules in microseconds. It could even help detecting live DDoS attacks. It's the programmable kernel. We're moving from a world where software is installed to a world where the operating system is a living, breathing, evolving nervous system. And finally, Linux has left Earth. NASA used to rely on incredibly expensive custom-coded real-time OSs. But for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter and SpaceX's Falcon 9, they chose Linux. Why? Because Linux is battle-tested by millions of nerds every single day. Shh! Do you hear that? That's the sound of forgiveness. If there's a bug, someone in Sweden or Tokyo has already found it and patched it. When we eventually send humans to Mars, they won't be flying on a proprietary black box OS from a defense contractor. They'll be flying on the same kernel you use to run your oh. Minecraft server. It's more reliable, more modular, and it's the only project that can handle the complexity of a 20 minute signal delay across a vacuum of space. It's 40 million lines of code. It's 15,000 strangers who have never met shouting at each other on a mailing list to make sure your Wi-Fi works. We've built our entire species future on a hobby project. It's the most collaborative thing we've ever done. And yet, I still bet half of you can't get it to recognize your second monitor without a Google search. Humanity is weird. Thanks for watching. Carl! There is a dead human in our house! Oh, hey! How did he get here? Carl, what did you do? Me? I, I, I didn't do this. 